I, I, whenever I go to a producer's farm, I always tell them that observe your animals and, and look at your data. Because the way you are doing things, there is, there's a possibility that there are certain things that you're missing out if you do not, uh, not, not a good observer. So I always, my first thing is to look at the data, do a data recording, look at the data. If anything is not in the normal line, you need to change that managemental practice. <laughs> Welcome to the Beef Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandy Buzzard, and it's my pleasure to bring you the trending issues and topics with the best and brightest minds of the beef industry. Today, we are joined by Dr. D. Walker Vias, who is an assistant professor of ruminant nutrition at the University of Florida. Florida. Dr. Vias earned his DVM at the College of Veterinary and Animal Sciences in India, his Master of Veterinary Science in Animal Nutrition from the National Dairy Research Institute in India, and his PhD in Nutrigenomics from the University of Maryland. Dr. Vyas conducts research on applied aspects of ruminant nutrition with direct effect on efficiency of livestock production. His research is focused on improving forage quality, optimizing inclusion of feed additives, and improving quality of animal resource food for sustainable growth of livestock enterprises. The long-term goal of his research program is to enhance sustainability of both small and large ruminant production systems, which if you've been listening to the podcast long, you know that I'm. we are all very passionate about that. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Vias here. How are you today? I'm doing great, Randy. How are you doing? I am um, really good. It rained at my house this morning and nobody was expected, uh, expected it. I was awakened by a loud crack of thunder and um, a loud crack of thunder, and that kind of started my day off great. So how are, how are things in Florida? <laughs> well, last week it was very hot and humid, and um, we were just hoping that it rains, and it, it's raining from last couple of days. So now it's, we are feeling a little better because um, I'm sure, you know, these months are not good in Florida, like these two, three months. It, it's so hot, so humid. You just don't want to be outside. I don't think they're good anywhere. <laughs> I know, I know. No, but I'm really feeling better. Uh, I was just in Florida in June for the Livestock Marketing Association Conference, and I um, it was muggy then. And so I can only imagine what it's like there now. And I'm, I don't mean to be too blunt, but I, I'm glad that I'm not there <laughs> right now. We are waiting for these two months to be over. Yeah. <laughs> Starting September, October, we will feel fine. Yeah. Well, they, every, one day at a time, we'll get there. So... Um, well, we're, again, I'm very excited to have you here. Just to get us started off with, um, I know that you know there's probably several listeners who know who you are and familiar with you, but for those of us who are just meeting you today, can you tell us a bit about how you got involved in the beef industry and your career path so far and, and how you, um, you know, found your way to your assistant professor role at Florida? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I, I grew up in India and um, it's in the northwestern part of India, which is which is very dry. Uh, temperatures are like Arizona, which is more than 120 sometimes in summer. So very hot and dry weather I grew up in. And my very first experience of getting to animal sciences was when I got into my doctorate of veterinary medicine program. Um, I, I finished that from India. And um, after finishing my DVM, um, I decided that um, I am not much interested in clinical research, uh, but I'm more interested in the non-clinical research, which is more uh, focused on the production aspects. And uh, I was very fortunate that uh, I got into master's at the National Dairy Research Institute in India. It is uh, one of the eminent institute uh, that does most of the research on dairy production systems. And uh, I was involved in uh, some of the research uh, projects that are more focused on how we can improve the forage quality and how much impact it has on the performance of animals. And it was very, very applied uh, program uh, because the, the place where I grew up, the forage quality is a big, big challenge for production. Um, after, finish my, after finishing my master's, um, I, I came to the States um, and continued uh, working on my PhD at the University of Maryland in College Park. Um, I worked with Dr. Rich Erdman, and um, my focus was on the dairy production systems and how we can make it more efficient so that uh, it's more profitable for our producers. So I finished my PhD from Maryland uh, College Park, and then after that, I was very, very fortunate that I got into a postdoc position uh, for Agriculture Canada. So I 
I was working in uh, Lethbridge. Uh, There's a Lethbridge Research and Development Center, which is south of Calgary, a very small town. I think we're very well known for the Agriculture Canada Research Station. And um, so I started my postdoc, and that's where I got in touch with the beef production systems. Um, my focus in, 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 um, as a postdoc was on research projects that are more focused on environmental sustainability and animal health. And um, that was my very, very first experience on how we can change the production systems to be more resource efficient uh, by reducing greenhouse gases and by improving profitability and balancing both at the same time, right? Because both are important for the producers. You cannot just compromise any of those. And then um, I finished my postdoc in 2016 And I got this position uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Florida in Animal Sciences Department. And ever since um, I have been uh, here and um, my program is again more focused on, as you mentioned earlier, uh, both large and small ruminants. Um, So my research projects are on beef cattle, dairy cattle, uh, sheep and goat, but again, focused on the sustainable livestock production. So that's interesting, you've been uh, you've done it's, you've done research in a lot of places, um, but specifically, most recently, in two very different you know geographic regions. You know, so you were in Canada and now you're in Florida, and so I, I have to imagine there are some concessions or adaptations that you have to make with your research between these two, or, or maybe better said, um, are there discoveries that you made in Canada that are just not feasible in Florida, or like vice versa? Very interesting question. Thank you very much, Randy, because um, I, I totally agree. You know, uh, when we say livestock production, we always think that, you know, it's, it's the same system in every country, but there are so many differences. Mm-hmm. I'll just share with you one example. So when I started my postdoc, I started working on a chemical additive that reduces methane emission, that is 3-nitroxypropanol. And some of the very earlier studies that came out from this additive was during my postdoc work. And the results were great. And I was very excited that, okay, when I when I go to Florida, I can start, keep working on, on 3-nitroxypropanol. Now, but the challenge here is that <laughs> it's not I approved. Feel, I feel an uh-oh coming on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so my excitement really went down because... I was, I mean, it is not approved. It cannot go into the food chain. And um, I'm really hoping that someday we can we can have that and then we can use the kind of research projects I did. I can continue working with the producers. I mean, I can still do research trials, but working with producers I always, always expect to do. And um, so hopefully sooner than later, we get to work on that. So this is just a very small example. The, the other example that I can share is... Um, the kind of forages that are being used for the okay. production systems. Yeah. Um, cold weather, the type of forages are different. Um, most of the research was done on barley silage. Okay. Um, and then when I come here in Florida, there's not much barley silage. So it's mostly corn. And um, so you have to tweak your rations accordingly so that uh, you, uh, you formulate based on the kind of forages that you're using and then make sure that the performance is not compromised despite changes in the forages. Um, So yes, that does change a lot of things in terms of research. So just to clarify, so the first example you gave the, I can't pronounce the, the chemical or the whatever, the solution that you were using, but it was, was it legal in Canada and not United States? Is that, did I get, did I say that right? Or did I miss something? Um, So even in Canada, uh, we only use that for the research because it that product is still in the testing phase. Oh, okay. Now I understand. It's just it's not a you can I understand now. You can use it in research, but not. Yes. I'm 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 following now. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And when when we think about um, um, greenhouse gas mitigation, that product has shown consistent mitigation of greenhouse gases. Mm-hmm. So. When we started, when we proved that concept that, yes, this product is working, I was really excited that we can use that at the farm mm-hmm. and, um, and then make make the entire production system more sustainable, whether it's a grazing management system or the intensive systems, but we are still waiting for approval. Right. 
and that's that what changes everything. So is that is that approval coming in the next year or two or five? Do you have any do you have any guidance on when it might happen? I hope so. I really hope so. So I, I don't know. I really don't know the nitty gritties of, of this approval process, but I really hope that it, it comes sooner than later. Right, right. Well, so that's research you've done in the past. Do you, um, what are you, like, what are you excited about and working on right now? Maybe in that, like, just to narrow it down, like in your sustainability feed additives area, can you tell us about some of your research you're working on right now in that, in that area? Oh, sure, sure. Um, so most of my research is focused on feed additives and um, how we can optimize the inclusion of feed additives to make sure the performance is more efficient. Uh, so animals use less resources and they produce at an optimal level. That, that's what my goal is. And we have tested different kinds of feed additives. Um, so right now, what I am excited about is the another area that I'm getting into that is more life cycle assessment. Oh, okay. And, and the reason I'm I'm really excited about this area because when we use feed additives, that, that that's what I've used for my research projects, you just mitigate the enteric methane emissions that is coming from the feed fermentation. But there is a possibility that there are other factors in the production systems that have not been taken into account. So yes, you can reduce methane emissions, but what if the emissions from the manure goes up because of the feed additive? Yeah. Um, yes, you, you you decrease methane emissions, you decrease nitrous oxide emissions from manure. But what if the transport of that feed additive to the farm is, is resulting in a carbon dioxide emissions that adds up to the greenhouse gases? So that means you have to take the complete life cycle uh, uh, of the production system into the picture to make sure that we develop some strategies that are more sustainable taking the entire life cycle in the picture. So we have just started a couple of projects here. Uh, one project that we have just wrapped up was um, we went to different cow-calf operations in Florida, and then we went to North, Central, and South Florida. We went to different cow-calf production systems. We met with the producers. We we got all the details from, this, from, their, from their farms, whatever we can collect, number of animals, number of calves they have, the kind of feeding system they have, the kind of supplements that they do, the kind of management that they do that they have. And then we just come in our lab and just put in these numbers and prepare a life cycle assessment. What is interesting about this and which which I, I really like it is that when we, we can look at the can, entire picture of the cow-calf operation and we can figure out which one are the hot spots of greenhouse gases. Uh, which one are the hotspots where the system is not very efficient? And then we can go back to the producers and then share our findings with them and say that, okay, some of these findings are from the life cycle assessments. And then these are the parts in your managemental practices that needs to be taken care of that will improve not only the environmental sustainability, but also the economic sustainability of these operations. So, and, and the other part, which I would like to mention here, which, which again, I'm very excited about, is introducing a concept of net protein contribution. Because there is always a, a discussion, um, in the social media at least, <laughs> uh, it's a competition for food and feed, right? So we are growing uh, feed for, for animals and we could have grown food for human consumption. So there's a competition. Now, there was a paper that came out, I think, a few years back. They looked at how much of this human edible food that is going in for feeding animals. Right. It turned out more than 80% of the feed that are being consumed by animals um, is coming from a human inedible sources. Right? So That's these great. Are, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we talk about competition, but actually there's not much. Um, and another facet of, 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 of this concept is that we should think about how much human edible protein these animals are consuming and how much human edible proteins these animals are producing. So that shows us an efficiency, right? Right, right. And that efficiency is always, always more than 100%. So they consume less, they produce more protein. And that goes against the concept 
that ruminants are the most inefficient uh, species. They are not. Right. Um, so this is where we are getting into. So we, we do life cycle assessment and at the same time, we also provide a net protein contribution. So what we do is that we, we assess the feeding systems of the cow calf operations and then we figure out how much is the human edible component of the feeding system and then how much is the human edible beef coming out of that system and then we make these comparisons for the net protein contribution. So other than my research program that I have been doing, I, I think your question was what I'm excited about and that's where that's where I'm going now. <laughs> Well, it's very, I mean, it's very easy to tell that you're excited about it. Like you can feel your, um, your passion for the subject and your work is, is palpable. So yes, I mean, it's, it's, and I'm very excited to hear what you're talking about. Like, I think every beef producer wants to hear that our efficiency is over a hundred and you know, that the cat at cattle are the least, um, I can't remember the phrase you use, but are like the most efficient livestock, you know, they don't waste as much. So I think that that's, that's a great, um, outcome. So that research sounds like it's meeting your hypothesis and has like a positive outcome that you're excited about. You have, is every project like that? Or are there are some projects that just don't quite work out like you hope? Yeah. So again, thank you. This is a very interesting question because <laughs> I'm not trying to stump you. I just... No, I think uh, because when we work with feed additives, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. the beauty about this area. Um, so we always start with hypothesis that, you know, these feed additives are supposed to work in certain way. Um, but then when we run these, these feeding studies, sometimes we see promising results and sometimes we don't. So uh, let's give you an example. So we, we finished a, a study with, um, a direct fed microbials where we, we feed a bacterial strains. Um, and then we know that how this bacteria functions how this bacteria degrades feed, how this bacteria degrades fiber under lab conditions. And we want to see if that same thing happens in under in vivo conditions in the animal, animal systems. Um, so we did a couple of studies. In one study, we got excellent results where we fed these direct fed microbials. It was uh, this, this bacterial strain was able to increase the fiber di- digestion and was able to increase the performance. But in the second study, no results at all. So oh. yes, <laughs> oh. that's why that's what I, uh, I I I said that this is a very interesting question because sometimes we do prove our hypothesis and sometimes we have to say, well, better luck next time. Better luck next time. That's not ever. You have a positive outlook on it though. Your um, your attitude about it is really good. But just better luck next time. So that's admirable. <laughs> I guess if you're going to be in the re- in the line of work of research, you have to be willing to take the, the highs with the lows and so on I and know. so forth. I, I always tell my students that um, I did three projects in my, my PhD and all of these three projects failed. So, but that doesn't mean that the research was not good. So no negative results are good results. So we Yeah, know- you still learn something from it. So it's still research with an outcome. It's just, I imagine, not what you were hoping would happen. So you're obviously you have a lot going on with research and or some exciting things that have you looking forward to the future. Um, I think you mentioned that you have graduate students and um, and also maybe you have extension responsibilities. Um, can you speak maybe what is your favorite part about research and extension on, on the parts that you do with that? Sure, definitely. Uh, so my uh, my position is uh, 70 percent research and 30 percent teaching. And um I did share some details about my research program, but what is most fascinating part about my position is to work with students. I just enjoy, enjoy that process. Um, So I normally have about four to five graduate students in my lab. Oh, um, that seems like a lot. (laughs) It's it's always good to have more students so they can, uh, I mean, because they can work on different kinds of projects. Uh, So that that's an average. Sometimes it's lower than four or five. Sometimes it's more than that. So on an average, I, I keep that number. And I also make sure that my lab is open to undergraduate scholars uh, to, to, to expose them what the research looks like and how research programs are, are, are made and then how research is conducted and how do we apply these findings because these undergrads are always looking for some of these exposure and opportunities to figure out what what uh, what next they can do. Mm-hmm. So 
that that's another very important component of my program is uh, teaching. Um, so with my graduate students, um, they, they are mostly involved in research. But for my teaching component, uh, I, I have an undergraduate course, which is more focused on animal nutrition, that is food, animal nutrition and feeding, where I cover beef cattle nutrition, dairy cattle nutrition and swine nutrition, because these are all food animals. So this is my undergraduate class and, and all my students are mostly interested in either going to industry or to a vet school. Um, some of the students do uh, go and pursue their graduate school uh, and they're interested in research. So that I offer once every year. And, and the second course that I offer as part of my teaching portfolio is principles of forage quality evaluation. Oh, okay. And this is in line with the other objectives of my research program is to improve the forage quality. Because in Florida, I mean, yes, um, we can grow a lot of forages, but the problem is that the quality is, is really inferior. So that that program, uh, I, I have, I, I use that on my research part. I, that's also teaching portfolio. So this is principles of forage quality evaluations. I offer once every two years. And any student from agronomy or animal sciences interested in learning more about forages, forage quality, how to improve forage quality in subtropical conditions, that's the course uh, for them. Typically, do you have a very a pretty long waiting list for that class? If it's every other, if it's only every two years, is there is there quite a high demand for the students to come into the class? So I, I make sure that I have enough about fifteen to sixteen students in that class. And uh, to get 15 to 16 students, I need to offer it once every two years because, um, yes, we would like to get as many students as possible. But from agronomy and animal sciences, it at least takes two years to get that to get to that number. That's OK. Why. Oh, that makes sense. I understand. Yeah. Another very important component that we have in our department is um, we have also started international education where experts in different areas come together. Like I, I come from forage quality aspect, uh, other people, other experts come from uh, reproduction, uh, someone from nutrition. We all come together, we record our lectures and we offer these recordings uh, to, to students who are interested. Uh, and also not only in the US, but also outside of the country. Well, that's very valuable to have that kind of education and materials like at your finger or at their fingertips uh, if they need to go back and reference or just be able to to view it you know for their own personal development that's great yeah I, I totally agree and um, there has been much demand about uh, some of these courses because these are offered from experts uh, from the University of Florida and then they cover a specific area so that's why uh, these courses are in much demand and so are they I, is it multiple departments? Or is it like animal science and agronomy and is it, or is it all the same department, like all animal science? Yeah, there are multiple departments because we have uh, colleagues from agronomy, animal sciences, veterinary medicine. And so these three departments, we collaborate on, on different areas and then we, we provide our uh, recordings. Oh, okay, that's great. That's very valuable, that's super valuable. I, I, I totally agree. And and I think uh, in one of your question, you mentioned about extension. Um, I, I don't have extension responsibility, but but as as I mentioned earlier, you can never run away from extension. Um, so that's the headline: you can never run away from extension. <laughs> because you know, when you want to work with producers, that's your extension component. That's right. And, and again, this is very fascinating uh, to share research ideas uh, to the producers because here we are very fortunate that our producers are very much interested in uh, in learning. Uh, and also collaborating with us. Um, so we have a milk checkoff program. We have uh, the Florida Kettlemen uh, and Enhancement Board that provide research fundings. Um, and uh, we, we do get these projects funded from these uh, producer organizations that are very applied. So most of these projects have research as well as extension component. And so we have field days. Uh, we go to the producer's farm and then uh, we share results. Sometimes we do some experiments at their farm. So it's a very good collaboration. And, and, and it's, it's, I'm, sometimes I consider myself very fortunate to be, to be in this area where producers are so receptive uh, to changes and to changes management based on the research information that we generate. Well, that's great to hear that the people are receptive to your research and to the work that you're doing in Extension because you wouldn't want to be all that work for naught. 
you know, for people to not listen to it. So um, I guess on that same topic of beef producers, since you, we kind of segue to that, what is your biggest piece of advice or, um, or maybe it's two or three pieces, but you know, for what's your biggest piece of advice for beef producers in order to improve their animal performance? between the protein content or the nutrient availability of, of hay that has been cut and is stored inside and hay that sat and got rained on two or three times before it got, you know, moved inside, or maybe it's never stored inside. And so, I mean, that can make a big difference. And I think that's a really valuable piece of, of advice there. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because, uh, yes, uh, you have given a very good example of hay, hay storage. Now, the way we are storing hay that changes the forage quality and, and another area that I'm, I'm, I'm really sharing this uh, information with the producers, if they are feeding silage, it is, it is very important that they harvest at the right time um, and they make sure that, you know, it is, it is preserved well, it is compacted. Um, if you don't do some of these manageable practices while in siling, that might compromise the quality of the silage that you're feeding to your animals. So it, it, what you said, it holds true with hay, it holds true with silage. And some of this forage quality, uh, testing your grasses, it holds true for the grazing as well. We've had that experience firsthand, unfortunately, like where the silage didn't get packed. Um, we do forage sorghum, so sorghum silage, and it didn't get packed well enough. And so it it just spoiled. So we had, you know, all the money invested in in the seed and the growing and then paying the custom people to chop it and, and then pack it. And then it just, it just was wasted, like, you know, all the... And then unfortunately in a sustainability aspect, like all the water and resources that went into it, like that was also, so that was very frustrating. Um, but you're, you're right. Like every it's, it's not just, it's a scientific process. It has to be done the right way or it doesn't work. It doesn't work out. And then it's, yeah. I, I totally agree because, you know, this is very, very small things that can make mm -hmm. a huge difference uh, at the farm. I think that's, a, I think that is true across probably all industries, right? Like small things, add up to big things. And unfortunately, big things can get really expensive if they're not done done correctly. So five years down the road, you know, you, we, we talked some of your research in the future, and then you're hoping for some FDA approval on, on, on a, I'm going to call it a solution, but a, you know, a product. But five years down the road, do you see any major breakthroughs happening um, in the sustainability arena? as it relates to feed additives or maybe just in general as a how it relates to greenhouse gas? Like, do you see any major breakthroughs happening in your area? I really hope so. I really <laughs> hope so. Um, and I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, the, the way our research is going in animal agriculture. Uh, we, are, we are actually testing boundaries, right? Um, so there are a lot of different areas that, that I think uh, will change uh, in, in, a, in, in a better way. Uh, definitely a lot of research is going on feed additives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some feed additives that can reduce greenhouse gases. Um, and then the research is continued and we may have novel feed additives that consistently reduce methane emissions and make it more environmental sustainable. Um, uh, the ruminant production systems, whether you mm -hmm. talk about dairy cows or beef cattle systems. Um, I think I, I, I shared you an example of a 3-nitroxypropanol, which mm -hmm. is called yes. Ovair. Um, it, it is from DSM. That is that is a really good feed additive. Um, there is more and more research going on on algae, um, and then uh, so I mean I, I really hope you know that all of these research culminates into a product that our producers can use um, uh, at their farm. The another area which I'm really optimistic about is use of artificial intelligence uh, oh, in animal okay. because. This artificial intelligence can 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 make sure that our resources are used very efficiently. Mm -hmm. And I can just give you an example. Um, for example, when we are harvesting forages for silage, it's very important that it is harvested at the right dry matter. If you're just talking about corn silage, let's say, it, it should be harvested between 30 to 35% dry matter. So you go to the field, you, you take your samples, you just chop it, you put that in the oven, and then you get the dry matter. It's, it's a pretty cumbersome process, right? And, and artificial intelligence can, can make this process very easy because we can have some sensors on the drones. They can measure the dry matter. Now the producer will know what is the right dry matter at what point, and they can 
they can actually manage their harvest accordingly. So I'm just sharing a very, very small example on how AI can manage these things completely differently on how we are using our resources right now. So that's why I'm very optimistic for future. I, I, like sometimes, I don't know, I get a little wary about AI because you see like deep fakes of celebrities being impersonated and I saw the movie iRobot and so that <laughs> that <laughs> gives me some pause but from a from a production standpoint making things easier and more efficient and more accurate like I mean that I think there's a lot of potential there for that and I'm not like I think I told you offline when we were having our little bit of technological difficulty here I have no tech savvy at all so I'm glad there are much smarter people out there managing the development of AI and how it can be applied in agriculture. I'm on the same page. Uh, <laughs> I'm not tech savvy, so I'm really looking forward to collaborators from people who knows how to use AI. <laughs> right, right. That's why we, I appreciate collaboration with experts um, in their specific areas. So, well, when you aren't conducting research or helping producers or teaching classes or things like that, do you, what do you fill your time with? Any hobbies or anything of that nature? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you need to have hobbies, right? Um, we well, always some, have... some people don't. Some people just work all the time. So, but you should say that louder. You need to have hobbies. You need to have hobbies. You need to have hobbies because you need to strike a balance between your work and your life. And um, so, when I'm not uh, on, on involved in research or teaching or extension, um, I, I I like to play sports and um, I like to play three sports uh, regularly, uh, which is tennis. Uh, table tennis and uh, cricket and um, so I make sure that every weekend at least twice um, I go and then I, I, I do these activities. I'm from India and uh, cricket is the number one sport over there so that's where we learned it and I, I, I have a group here we try to play um, uh, once every month or so. So yeah these are the hobbies and uh, sometimes when I, I get time um, I really like to read uh, some books and uh, uh, mostly autobiographies. I, I, I like to learn um, from some uh, like autobiographies. So yeah, that's that's what my hobbies are and try to spend some time on them. I, um, I find cricket very interesting. We, I lived in Australia for about a year. And so they have cricket in Australia. And as try as I, try as I might, I could not understand. I, and I never really invested like hours into learning the rules, but it, it seems very difficult to hit this weird, this, the ball isn't weird, but it seems like it's not hard, like a golf ball or soft, like it's a, a different texture. And yeah, I, it just, I'm very interested in it, but I just know very little about it. And when you don't know very much about a sport, it's hard to get, you know, invested in it. So I spent a lot of time with people who were watching it and just kind of observing. <laughs> well, but, um, uh, I mean I, I think uh, if it's just a hobby, uh, it's very easy to play mm -hmm. because, you know, there is no pressure and then you're just enjoying your time. But uh, if you're playing uh, uh, at the professional level, yes, every sport is difficult. Right. <laughs> have you um, have you been playing? Did you play tennis when you uh, lived in India at the same time you played cricket? Or is that something that you started playing when you moved to the United States? No. So I, I started playing tennis was when I was in India uh, as well. So both tennis and, uh, and cricket. I started yeah. when I was, I was studying uh, in my DVM. And yeah. uh, so it's been a long time. So I really enjoy these two sports. Yeah. You must be like expert level if you've been playing them for that long. That's, that's not just a side hobby. That's like an investment at that point. Yeah, but but you improve at a certain certain level so that it stays until your hobby and you never go professional. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any any have you set your sights on that at some point? Yeah, I mean uh, I, I never I never looked for that because I knew I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> so oh, <okay. laughs> I, I just try to enjoy my game. <laughs> okay, well that's fair enough. We have a time and labor saving product for you. Beef and dairy agrislat by Healthy Farms is your solution. No more lugging jugs around the barn every month. With beef and dairy agrislat, you simply drop the slat through the floor twice a year and it works to break down solids, reduces crusting and forming. To learn more, visit myhealthyfarms.com. 
Well, that's all the questions about your specific research that we have today. But I do have to ask you, we ask the same three questions of every guest. And so the and I gave you a heads up on these. Um, I don't like to spring them on people as a surprise. So what is your favorite beef or cattle related book or resource or like website or maybe it's a an extension pamphlet or something like that? Or maybe it's just a book. Yes. Yeah, so beef related book. Um, there are a couple that that I can uh, I can uh, recommend because, again, I, I'm mostly a researcher. I, I try to, to get more research information from from these books. So one that uh, that is my go-to book for nutrition is a uh, nutritional ecology of ruminants. Uh, this is by uh, Dr. Van Soest. Um, very old book. I think it was written in seventies, and then more updated versions came later on. But I I like that book a lot because that discusses a very fundamental concepts of nutrition for ruminants and. Um, Dr. Van Soest is one of uh, the stalwarts in the field of ruminant nutrition. And uh, this book came from him. So I, I get to learn a lot from, from that book. Um, and, and the second book that, that I always, that, that is my go-to is, is NRC, uh, National Research Council, because, and again, it is, it is very fascinating because, you know, they, they, they add all the updated research information and how this is applied for the ration formulation to make sure that your diet that you're feeding to your animals are balanced and the and and, and it's good it's good for the performance. So these are my two go-to books for for beef cattle. Well, that sounds like a great resource that you use there at your fingertips for your for research and things of that nature. But what is a book that is not related to the beef industry that you really love or you're currently reading? Oh, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really like autobiographies and. Um, Right now, I just finished um, a shoe dog from Phil Knight. Oh. It's a story of a Nike creator, and it's a fascinating book. And uh, I highly encourage anyone to read it because um, we only see the success, right? And um, when, when we read this, these kind of books, we see all the struggles that went behind uh, making such a great company. So I, I, I like highly recommended book. I'll have to add that to my list because I really like sport. I, I love sports and um, I've got the movie air on my watch list about um, Nike and Mike, uh, Michael Jordan and such. So I'll have to add that. Yes, book yes, yes. I'll right. have to add that book to my list. So, and then, so our final question is what is a trait of someone that you look up to or admire that has enabled them to be successful? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Randy. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have looked up to um, my mentors in my PhD, my mentors in my postdoc, my parents. And one thing that was very common to all of them was being helpful uh, to others um, and try to provide as much guidance as possible. And um, I, have, I have tried to use that trait for, for, for in, in my program for my students. So... And I have seen that, you know, when my mentors, that when, when I was under the training phase, I didn't know much and they were very patient. They were very helpful. That's the trait I really admire because, you know, that takes your stress level down and that makes your learning experience very enjoyable. And, and the second trait, which I, I loved um, from, from my mentors, was that they were consistently doing something that needed to be done. And this, this brings me to this quote of Denzel Washington. And I'm not sure if you, if you, if you have heard that, Brandy. It's, it's without commitment, you never start. But without consistency, you never finish. And that's, that's the trait I've seen with every successful people. If they are feeling bad, doesn't matter. They will just go ahead and they will work. If they are feeling great, that's fine. I mean, this is just a consistency in their work ethic. So... I, I admire that trait and I try to inculcate that, but you know, it's easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. But that makes, if it was easy, everybody would do it. So it. Yeah, exactly. That's right. It speaks That's to right. the consistency and the commitment that you were speaking about. So, well, thank you for sharing those things with us. Uh, we always like to know a little bit about, you know, your back, you know, out, outside of your professional um, areas. So thank you for sharing that. That is all the questions I have and all the time I have for today. Thank you for bearing with us today, Dr. Vias, through all the, technological difficulties, but through our questions and things like that. 
um, really enjoy We really appreciate you being here on the podcast show. And I really enjoyed getting to know you. If people want to find out more information about your research or follow you, um, where can they do that? So um, to get more updates uh, on my research program, um, uh, please visit Animal Sciences website at the University of Florida. Uh, there is more updated information on the kind of projects that, that we have. I'm also on social media. So I have a very active Twitter account. Um, it goes by Nutri Dairy. And uh, I try to post uh, research updates, uh, try to find something that is really, really exciting about, uh, about uh, animal agriculture. And um, I'm also on LinkedIn. So again, I try to share most, most of the research updates, lab updates, more uh, interesting research information coming out from animal agriculture. So I, I can be on link, you can find me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter um, or definitely animal website, uh, sorry, animal sciences website. Well, that's great. Um, we'll put make the per, we will make sure to put that in the show notes that you can follow Dr. Vias on Twitter at Nutridary or also on LinkedIn. Um, thank you again for being here with us, Dr. Vias. We really appreciate it. And um, for our audience, thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll join us next week on the Beef Podcast. <laughs>